Well, I'm addressing you this evening from Greece, not far from Athens, about an hour and a half north and east on the, uh, the coast. The sea is just about 100 yards to my right out the door. It's at night or I would uh, tilt so you could see the beautiful scenery out that way. Uh, workers throughout Russia are here for three or four days for encouragement, for training. Uh, there's a good chance people will walk through these doors, so it may be more interesting than I even planned. Uh, but the topic for the, uh, the lecture is I'm going to look at historical foundations of Christianity. And I might have to step down to keep the, uh, the computer awake as uh, we look at these for the next 25 to 30 minutes. In your textbook, we're looking at chapters 5 and 6. Uh, the authors give uh, several reasons, kind of an overview why to study missions history. Again, nothing new really there. It helps to avoid the same mistakes and to grow from the past successes. Uh, we often talk about standing on the shoulders of those who go before us. It helps us to think more humbly of ourselves. As Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, there's no, nothing new under the sun. And so uh, there really is nothing cutting edge that there has been some approach probably that was similar, maybe a nuance of difference. Uh, three, it helps us with cultural awareness and blind spots. It kind of keeps us honest as we look at the flow of history and where's our part in that. And lastly, it can inspire us to step out by faith. Because the next couple lectures, especially I'll look at biographical sketches of many workers throughout the history of missions history. And we will be challenged by their faithfulness and their perseverance, even through trials. Well, chapter 5, the expansion of Christianity, part 1. Uh, and it goes all the way back to Acts chapter 2, because missions erupted, really, at Pentecost. Uh, you remember in Acts 1, 8, that uh, Jesus said, And you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so, well, what happened? Again, we could read all of chapter 2, but I'm going to read Acts 2, 5 through 11. And I want you to listen to the ethnic groupings that were represented there. For it says, Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And so again, fairly conclusive, inclusive. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because they were each one hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? And then the roll call. Parthenians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya, around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs. And so again, you see a representation from many, many, many different nations. They came to Pentecost. They came for the Jewish festival. They did not anticipate the coming of the Holy Spirit. But while they were there, and the apostles had been praying, the eleven, and they chose a replacement for Judas. And then, filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to preach. And probably they were spread out across the Temple Mount, and they began to preach. We only have the record of Peter's sermon, and yet 3,000 came to faith that day. Now again, remember, Jesus had promised, Acts 1-8, the Holy Spirit would come, and then he promised what would happen. And he speaks about the expansion of Geographically, Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Also, you can think of it as socially. When you look at Jerusalem, Judea, that's pretty monocultural. Samaria, okay, they were half-breed. So this was also a barrier. And then the ends of the earth, ultimately we're talking Gentiles. And so it is geographical, but it's much more than that. And there have actually been dissertations written about how the apostles were disobedient to the command of Acts 1-8. Because they did not naturally, even filled with the Holy Spirit, go outside Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Now, there are stories. Philip, he crossed the barrier with the Samaritans in Acts 8. Uh, later in that chapter, with the Gentiles, the Ethiopian, a God-fearer who had come up. And so we do see anecdotally, but it's not until the martyrdom of Stephen. Stephen is stoned in uh, the seventh chapter of Acts. And interestingly, when you come to the beginning of the 8th chapter, you have Acts 1-8 fulfilled in Acts 8-1. It says, then they spread out. Then they dispersed. And again, we have records of early churches 
in most of those places, those people groups that I read just a moment ago. Uh, we see that ultimately Peter goes to Cornelius, that's Acts chapter 10. We see in Acts chapter 11, the emerging of the church in Antioch, which is going, going to become the missionary sending center of the ancient world. It's not really Jerusalem, but it's going to become Antioch. Uh, the true spark of the expansion of the church, second only to the coming of the Holy Spirit, is the conversion of Saul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, this one who persecuted the church was an eyewitness to the stoning of Stephen in chapter 8, verse 1. He is converted on the road to Damascus, there to persecute the believers, and that became the first impetus, humanly speaking, of missions in that first century. I would direct you to pages 98 and 99 in your books if you can find Eusebius's quote there. But with Paul going to Antioch, it became the center and the sending city for missions. It was the third largest city of that day, Rome being the first, Alexandria in the northern Africa, and then Antioch. So a significant city. Also significant from Acts chapter 11. It's the first place where believers were called Christians. Uh, it was a term of derision more than a positive moniker, but they were known because they were little Christ. They lived, spoke, and taught as Christ had. Uh, besides Paul, actually the scripture is fairly silent regarding missions and the original apostles. Now there are interesting church histories. Uh, Thomas purportedly went up to Parthia, which is uh, the eastern part of Iran today, and then on to India. And there are early indications of Thomas Christians in India. Uh, Andrew went to Scythia, which would have been western part of Iran, and even into modern-day Ukraine. Uh, Peter uh, purportedly went to Rome, was crucified upside down. Again, there's no scriptural evidence of any of this. Uh, John, the beloved apostle, went to Ephesus in Turkey. And then later, of course, we do know, was exiled to Patmos. And others actually went as far as Spain in the British Isles. And so again, tradition tells us that the apostles went out ultimately uh, before they died, but scripture does not explicitly teach us that. Paul was the missionary motor, humanly speaking, about what God was doing across the empire and in the early church. Well, by the second century, toward the end, Christianity had touched every main province in the Roman Empire. By the end of the third century, we find records of a Christian church uh, in every major city. Now, there were persecutions sporadically in the 60s. You have Nero by the end of the first century, Domitian, and different ones uh, throughout those first three and four centuries. Uh, when you come to the beginning of the 300s, the beginning of the fourth century, it is still illegal as a religion. And then everything changes in the year 313. Constantine is going to battle. He purportedly records a vision where he sees a cross and he hears the words, by this sign, conquer. Again, some look with skepticism because they see the, the church was going to be a unifying factor Constantine needed for military purposes. Others say, no, it was a true conversion. This side of heaven, we will not know. But what we do know is in 313, the Edict of Milan, sometimes called the Edict of Toleration, was presented and became law. And this not only reversed the illegality of the Christian church, it made it the official church. Now again, Roman Catholics basically date back to 313 because then the church became Roman. And it was the Roman Catholic Church. They would see this as a great event. Uh, no longer were Christians persecuted. They were free. But of course the price was steep. That all of a sudden, Constantine was given incentives, giving them even money, robes, for those who would, quote, confess Christianity. Uh, stories are told of even uh, soldiers walking through a creek, and as they pass out the other side, a priest pronouncing them baptized. And so you had thousands of unregenerate people coming into the church, and that was a new day. Now, there was the end of martyrs, but that began the monk or monastery movement. Because earlier, the martyrs were those who were faithful even unto death. Well, now there was no penalty 
And so the monks sought to express full obedience, full conviction, commitment uh, by seclusion, by other ways. And so it's interesting that the martyrdom movement gave way to the monk, a monastery movement, like Columba in Boniface. Uh, Kenneth Scott Lauderette, the missions historian, wrote and called the next thousand years the thousand years of uncertainty. Now, the church grew in influence, it grew in wealth, but it waned in missions fervor. By the 7th century, Islam was making its way north and west. Uh, the Crusades responded to that into the 11th century. Uh, Roman Catholic missions expansion uh, basically followed the colonization. And so where the Brits or the Italians or the uh, French or the Spanish any of these uh, Catholic background places began to add colonies, the priests went with them. At the beginning, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, uh, after the Reformation, the Jesuits were started and were really the most militant of these orders. Uh, among these prominent would be probably uh, the Portuguese Jesuit Francis Xavier, uh, as he went to India and Japan and was effective, successful. Uh, interesting side note, the current uh, Pope, Pope Francis, he boasts that his name comes from both Francis Xavier as well as Francis of Assisi. And so there is that mission aspect even in our, quote, current Pope. Well, that was the, the movement of history until the 16th century. Interestingly, 500 years ago this month, this is October the 1st, October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther tacked up the 95 points of debate to the 95 theses. Uh, now, what's interesting, most people in America don't realize that November 1st is a special day for Roman Catholics, especially still in Europe. It's called All Saints Day. Uh, again, I live in Poland. Uh, families will be together more on November 1st than December 25th, than on Christmas Day. And what you need to remember about Luther's Day is the Cathedral Church of Wittenberg, Germany, boasted over a thousand, some say over 10,000, holy relics. Now again, it sounds fanciful to us, but they claimed, seriously claimed, that they had a twig from the burning bush, that they had a sliver of the cross, they had hay from the manger where Jesus was, was laid, uh, they had the thumb of St. Anne's, uh, Mary's mother. And so on All Saints Day, there would be a parade through Wittenberg, where they would show these relics, they'd go to the cemetery and they'd pray for dead people. Well, it was the day before that Luther finally said, enough. And that's when he tacked up those 95 uh, points of discussion or debate. And unwittingly, uh, it was not his plan, but he launched the Protestant Reformation. Uh, now, sadly, the Reformation did not prompt a mission movement. Uh, it was a fight for survival for, for quite a while. It was the cry of Scripture alone, faith alone, and grace alone. And so, again, that wasn't a, an immediate response of the uh, Reformation. Although the focus back on the Scriptures, it was inevitable that it would lead to uh, a missionary response. Uh, the rise of pietism in the next century, the 17th century, prop prompted some missionary endeavors. Likewise, the Moravian missionary movement began in uh, 1732. Over 200 missionaries were sent out from Hernhut in South Germany. Count Zinzendorf was the benefactor of this large uh, estate that welcomed all these dissidents, uh, many from Czech and different places. And they went out. Some of them even went to the Caribbean. And they discovered that they had to become slaves to actually spend time with slaves. And yet they were willing to do that. And so that was like the precursor of what became the modern missionary movement. Also, there were some from the continent of Europe that went to the colonies, American colonies, especially among the Indians. David Brainerd would be the most famous of these because he kept a journal. And at the age of 29, he died. But his journal influenced literally thousands who went on to become mission workers. Well, that's a fairly fast a survey of 1,800 years. But just to summarize, what are the lessons? Five, very quickly. Most fruitful work resulted from preaching and teaching the Bible. 
And again, that, that doesn't sound very creative, but there have been discussions throughout history. Do we civilize? Do we help with language? Do we educate? Uh, do we give a trade? And, and again, nobody would say these are bad things, but true indigenous missions begin to grow from preaching and teaching of the Bible. The second result is evangelism was a priority of the preaching. Again, there was preaching against social ills. There was preaching against uh, false practices. But ultimately, the gospel was proclaimed. Effective discipleship, number three, took place in the local church. And so the most effective missionary work then and now is that which results in local expressions of faith, communities of faith, New Testament churches. Uh, A fourth lesson is we find good and bad examples of contextualization. And I'll spend more time on that in a later lecture. But uh, that has been something progressively learned by workers who have done effective missionary work. And then the fifth is early missionaries served sacrificially through persecution and often death. Again, we stand on the shoulders of many, many faithful men and women, uh, many of them who bury uh, wives or husbands and children. So sacrificial service is a huge lesson that we learn in these 1,800 years. Well, to shift gears for my last few minutes in this lecture, I want to look at chapter 6, The Expansion of Christianity, Part 2, what's been called the Great Century and Beyond. The modern missionary movement generally traces back to 1792, William Carey gathering a small group of of English pastors and founding the the Baptist Missionary Society. One of the spots that you will see during uh, this course is uh, taken in the church where Carey was a pastor in Leicester, England. The audio is not great in that tape, but at least you'll get to see what became the church because it actually moved a couple of places. Uh, Before I look at several biographical sketches, which will be my next two lectures, I want to focus on the growing direction of missions from that sixth chapter in your book. In the 19th century, there grew a focus on indigenous missions, which led to more effective engagement in church planting. Indigenous meant that it was something that took root in that soil. And and to help you think of it this way, if uh, if you want to to have a plant thrive in a new place where you move, uh, you actually have, I'll just say, three options. Uh, You can take a plant that's in a, a, a large planter, or pot, and you can take it with you, and you can put it on your balcony, and you can water it, and uh, for a while at least, as long as it has space, it can grow and be a healthy looking plant. And that's what some people do. Uh, an example there would be is if, if I left America and went to any country, uh, Germany, and planted an, an English speaking church, just like the one in America. Okay? There's a second option. I could take that same potted plant, I could go overseas to another place, I could actually dig a hole in the ground somewhere and transplant that and put it in the hole and put dirt back on it and hopefully it'll grow. And that's the second option that I could move to Germany and I could take some of my trappings but but maybe learn the language and, and preach in Germany, though the schedule would be pretty much like our service in America, that would be another step toward indigeneity. Or the third, is when you take that seed and you go to that soil and you put it in and the seed dies and that tree grows or that plant grows and it is indigenous. And so that's what's meant by indigenous church planting, indigenous missions. Uh, in, in a short form, the, uh, the buzzword that evolved was often grouped under the heading of the three selves. Uh, and so good missions, positive missions carried those three self-acknowledgments, uh, self-supporting. It was discovered that uh, money from the outside often develops dependency and is not healthy. And so self-supporting, self-governing, that the indigenous people, the national people, the local people, as quickly as possible, take ownership and leadership of the new church. And then self-propagating, that they also learn how to reach others like them, their own countrymen, or those who are sojourning in their country. So that became kind of the the byword, that what we do, it must be self-governing, self-supporting, and self-propagating. 
Now, interestingly, about 50 years ago, a fourth self was added, self-theologizing. And it's still kind of a challenge in even modern-day missions that uh, we need to teach people how to develop theology. Now, again, it's, it's rooted in God's Word, but nuances and expressions and uh, currents will be obviously related to a given culture. But I want to come to the conclusions, page 132 from this chapter. Uh, God became recognized as the author of missions. That was a shift in the last hundred years. That missions wasn't just man's activity or man's idea, but it was God initiated. And that changed the, uh, the thrust of it as well as the responsibility of it. Two, the church is the engine that God uses to drive missions. It wasn't just the goal of starting churches, but it was the church that was sending and that was prompting this new way. Three, healthy missions always involves preaching and teaching God's word, a similar lesson from the earlier time period. Four, Christ-centered, grace-filled, biblically sound theology is essential. Theology matters. Doctrines matter because poor doctrines, poor theology leads to a poor foundation, which is not going to lead to multiplication. Number five, evangelism must include church planting to endure. There have been many parachurch organizations who have done good work around the world, but many times when they leave, the work falls because there's no lasting body of Christ. There's no uh, local church. And so that's why we always underscore and push toward church planting. Number seven, thoughtful contextualization is essential for local churches to endure and influence. If they look Western, if they look American, uh, their scope of influence is going to be very minimal. And lastly, missions history is also the history of sacrificial service. That was saying from the earlier period as well. That uh, there is much for us to learn from those who went before us. Again, my hope is this has helped you in these two chapters. And, and again, I wish you could see the beautiful Greek shore out there. But I'm going to close for now. And uh, just pray that God is blessing you as you continue through this course.